Good afternoon and welcome to the Orkney International Science Festival 2021 online and this year of Scotland's coasts and waters. My name is Julie Rich and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session from Orkney. And continuing in the theme of the Hudson's Bay Company, our speaker, Dr. Winona Wheeler of the University of Saskatchewan is a member of the Fisher River Cree Nation in Treaty 5 Territory, Manitoba, and her family are from George Gordon First Nation in Treaty 4 Territory, Saskatchewan. A lifelong student of Indigenous knowledge and history, Winona has written and taught Indigenous studies since 1988. Her research includes Indigenous oral histories, local histories, land claims and treaty rights, and settler colonialism. Without further ado, here is Dr. Winona Wheeler and her talk on the cures of Hudson's Bay. Thank you. And thank you to the International um, Orkney Science Festival for having me here today. Um, I shake hands with each and every one of you, Danse and Tawau. And I bring greetings from the traditional lands of the Willow Cree in Treaty 6 territory. My mother's people are from further south and are known as the George Gordon First Nation, Touchwood Hills people in Treaty 4 territory. My people are made up of Nihiopoetuk, Cree speaking Assiniboines, Soto people, and many mixed heritage peoples. Our first official chief who negotiated Treaty 4 in 1874 was baptized George Gordon. His Cree name was Kaneo Kaskoteo, walks on four claws. Most of our traditional names are now gone as a result of Christian baptizing, government officials unilaterally changing our names, intermarriage, and the colonial imposition of patriarchal family structures. My family genealogy includes indigenous descendants of Scottish men who came into my people's territory via the Hudson Bay Company fur trade. On my grandmother's side, we have Anderson and McNabb ancestors. On my grandfather's side, we have Sinclairs, as well as an English Fable and a French Florimond. All those ancestors married in and their de descendants were assimilated into indigenous communities. It's a strong tradition among our people to know our kinship ties and the nature of our relationships with others. And so it's important to me that you know how we are connected or how we're not. If a relationship does not exist, we determine if we are potential friends or enemies. The philosophical reasoning underlying this tradition is wakotuin. Literally, it translates to mean kinship or being related to each other. But like many Nihiawe Win Cree words, it means so much more than its literal translation. Wakotuin refers to an interconnected web of relationships. Matthew Wildcat explains that Wakotawin consists of three components. First, it references the act of being related to your human and other than human relatives. Second, it's a worldview based on the idea that all existence is animate and full of spirit. Since everything has a spirit, it means we're all connected to the rest of existence and live in a universe defined by relatedness. Third, there are proper ways to conduct and uphold your relationships with your relatives and other aspects of existence. Thus, Wakotawin includes the obligations and responsibilities people have to maintain good relationships. Maria Campbell, a Cree Métis author, explains further. She says, at what time it meant the whole of creation. And our teachings taught us that all of creation is related and interconnected to all things within it. Wakotawin meant honoring and respecting those relationships. They are our stories, songs, ceremonies, and dances that taught us from birth to death our responsibilities and reciprocal obligations to each other. Human to human, human to plant, human to animals, to the water, and especially to the earth. And in turn, all of creation had responsibilities and reciprocal obligations to us. Wakotawin is the act of being related, a worldview that everything is related and a set of laws governing how we conduct ourselves with and how we treat each other. Can I have the first slide, please? 
When the Hudson Bay Company arrived on our shores, we treated and interacted with them the same way we did with all strangers in our lands. They were not the first Europeans who came through our territory looking for new sources of wealth, but they were different because once they arrived, they stayed. The new source of wealth they coveted was the beaver fur, but they learned quickly that my people had no use for their mercantile approach to trade. And in order to acquire our furs, they had to learn and adopt our way of doing business that was based on Wakotawin. This meant that they had to enter into treaty alliances with us, a formal process that consisted of ceremonial prayer and the smoking of the pipe. Through the sharing of the pipe, both parties made a promise to each other and to the creator to maintain peace and support each other. The ceremony consisted of feasting, gift giving, and making relatives through adoption and intermarriage, which went against company policy of not fraternizing with local natives. Unlike European treaties at the time and now that were politically and economically motivated, Cree treaties were also social and ceremonial. In addition to agreeing to trade, there was also the obligation to help each other out in times of hardship and to back each other up in times of war. Allies were considered relatives, and when relatives were in need, you come to their aid. Next slide, please. Amishkak, beaver. Beaver was in great demand in Europe where they were hunted almost to extinction for their fur, valued in the production of felt hats, and their castorium. Amishkak are much revered four-legged peoples. They're amazing engineers who help maintain water tables and create ponds for other life. Almost every part of a beaver's body is used. The flesh was a delicacy. Smoked beaver tail soup is absolutely awesome if you ever have the chance. The fat was used for frostbite. Skins were used for clothing, moccasins, rope. Some of our people wrapped their deceased relatives in beaver robes for burial. And its castorium was an effective cure for so many physical ailments. Beaver trapping was well planned to ensure their continued well being and maintain balance between. According to Wakotawin, Cree people were instructed not to take more animal life than necessary. Prior to the European fur trade, we harvested primarily for subsistence and secondarily for trade with others for manufactured goods and, and food that we couldn't access like corn and wild rice and maple sugar, squash and beans. The demand for beaver by European traders and the increased demand for the time and energy saving European manufactured goods by my people resulted in changing relationships between my people and the beaver. In order to exploit the beaver, we had to shift our relationship with them from relatives to commodities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> beaver glands or castors. Beaver castors are pear shaped perennial scent glands or sacs on the inside of the body close to the reproductive organs. And it contains castorium. It's an, an orange brown alkaloid based substance. Um, it's bitter um, and highly odorous. It's a secretion, very thick. And that's what castorium is. The beaver uses their castorium to waterproof its fur and to mark its territory. Castorium is highly valued as an analgesic, an anti-inflammatory, an antipyretic with high levels of um, salicylic, excuse me, I can't do the salicylic acid. Um, it's a headache curative like aspirin. It's been used medically throughout history to cure mental illness, improve memory and many other conditions. <coughs> excuse me. Both Hippocrates and, and Pliny the Elder just prescribed castorium compounds for the treatment of hysteria. Through the Middle Ages, castorium was used to treat various symptoms of mental illness as an antispasmodic to treat epilepsy and a cure for tuberculosis. In 1685, Johannes Franco, an early advocate of scientific medicine noted that castorium destroys fleas, is an excellent stomach, stops hiccup, induces sleep, strengthens sight, and taken up the nose, it causes sneezing and clears the brain. It also has an intense vanilla flavor with a hint of strawberry and is used today as an additive to ice cream, soft drinks, 
Some alcoholic drinks, such as Swedish schnapps, candy, and perfume. The demand for beaver castorium was so huge during the fur trade that thousands of pounds of these little sacks were sent back to England. Next slide, please. Our traditional view and relationship with plant life is also governed by Wakotawin. We are taught that the earth provides all that we need to live, that we are dependent on her, and that the power plants have to heal is a life force generated from the strength of mother earth. The people developed intimate knowledge of plant life and their healing properties through keen observation of animals, through storytelling, dreams, visions, and from the plants themselves. And that knowledge was passed down through succeeding generations. Christy Belcourt, who wrote this book, Medicines to Help Us, Traditional Métis Plant Use, um, explains that in traditional ways of thinking, all plants have a spirit. They're understood as the first family because all life forms depend on them for survival. They're understood as the first family because all life forms depend on them. The healers who spent their lives apprenticing and learning about these medicines made a deep commitment to the creator through prayer, ceremony, fasting, or by other means in order to have and maintain the ability to help others. And when working with medicines, from the harvesting to the preparation and delivery, they respect the gifts they are given and follow the protocols that must be observed, which include reciprocity. Even today, when we go picking medicines, we begin and end with prayer and we offer tobacco. When the fur traders arrived and remained permanently among us, we treated them and their illnesses as we did our own. That was the only way we knew how to do things. They brought their own medicines, but sometimes they ran out or did not have enough or, or did not have specialized knowledge on how to treat certain conditions. The Hudson Bay Committee in London was actually curious about indigenous medicines. And so they asked um, local traders to um, find out more information about it. So company surgeons like George Spence, who was um, out in Fort Albany in 1738 to 53, um, he was directed by the, the committee, London committee to send home roots of herbs, plants and shrubs with seeds, berries and kernels, whilst the surgeons should identify them by their Indian names and list their qualities. Like other surgeons, Spence learned and adopted local Cree medicinal practices. Scurvy, for example, was a constant problem at the forts due to isolated locations and winter diets lacking fruit and vegetables. Basically, the disease is attributed to dietary deficiencies arising from lack of vegetables, reliance on salted pork, and weevily biscuits that made up rations on ships and on shore when fresh meat was unavailable. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although barrels of lime juice were shipped over with them, it was often poor quality and it deteriorated in storage. So the local Cree people taught them how to pick the buds of juniper trees and brew them into a drink that they called spruce beer. It was both a remedy and a preventative. Considerable time and effort was spent at the posts brewing spruce beer. Um, and it's recorded a lot, so you know it was a major activity. This slide is a, a drawing by um, Jeffrey and he depicts Jack Cartier accepting a decoction made from brewed juniper. So it was well known um, by the French as well when they got here. Another useful herb that was quickly adopted by the fur traders was Muskego Pakwa, which was Labrador tea. It comes from a small shrub found in forested areas, bogs, muskegs, and open tundra. And Cree people make this tea by boiling leaves and used it for treating asthma, colds, cough, pneumonia, bronchial and pulmonary infections. It also relieves stomach aches, headaches and soothes the nerves. The Hudson Bay men used this tea as a sedative, <clears throat> which when used regularly, cured nervous disorders. It was also used to strengthen the stomach, relieve headaches, um, it promoted perspiration, and it was applied to gangrenes and, and contusions. Next slide, please. The painting in the middle, um, beautiful painting by the late Plains Cree artist, Alan Sapp, and it's called Picking Roots. And Alan Sapp's work is unique and beautiful in that it captures everyday life that he grew up in. 
There's an art gallery dedicated to his work in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. On the right is the live Seneca root, the, the top portion, the, the leaves and the stems and the flowers. And on the, on the right, oh, that was the left. On the right is a sack of the Seneca roots that have been dug um, and dried. So Seneca root grows south of the Canadian Shield in the parkland and prairie regions. It's another powerful healer of many ailments, including poisonous snake bites and insect stings. The root is chewed and applied to the bite in a paste to draw out the poison. The root was also boiled as a tea and used to treat heart trouble. Um, and uh, the whole plant was boiled to make a diuretic. The root was collected in the summer, it was dried and it was stored for future use and trade. It was introduced to the Hudson, when it was introduced to the Hudson Bay Company, it was quickly adopted and highly sought after as a remedy for respiratory problems and a range of maladies. By the late 1700s, it was exported in large quantities to European apothecaries. In Europe, it was used as a diuretic expectorant and in the treatment of rheumatism, dropsy, typhus, asthma, and many other diseases. In Germany, it was found to prevent the form formation of cataracts. By 1887, it was over harvested to the point of near extinction in Eastern North America. Then it became widely harvested in the West by my people. Because it was in such high demand, it provided a significant income for many indigenous peoples in my area. The harvesting um, continued on into the 20th century and to the 21st century, but it peaked in about 1930 when 700,000 730,000 pounds of dried Seneca root was exported. By the mid 1950s, production dropped to about 150,000, but 75% of the world's supply of the root was harvested um, from my territory here. Like I say, it's still harvested today, not nearly as much as it was before and mostly for personal and family use. Next slide, please. This is wheat case. I'm holding some dried wheat case in my hand. It's also called calamus root or sweet flag or rat root. It grows in freshwater swamps, bogs, marshes, ponds, and river shorelines in, in the Northern hemisphere. And it grows in Asia, Europe, and North America, but it's not native to Europe. It was introduced to Central Europe from Southern Asia via Istanbul or Constantinople in the mid 16th century. It's an underwater, um, it's underwater rootstock. What I'm holding in my hand there is what is harvested and dried. On the left is a photograph of my friend, Glenda Abbott, um, a Cree healer, and she's harvesting bear root, which also grows underwater. I couldn't find a photo of harvesting rat roots, so I asked Glenda if I could borrow this one. But it's done the same way. You wade into murky water with bare feet, and you use your toes to locate the roots, the rhizomes under the sediment. Once your toes locate them, then you bend down to harvest. The roots are then cleaned and dried. It's the most widely used herb because it has so many valuable properties. It's an expectorant for curing common colds and bronchial problems. For colds, a tiny piece is bitten off and it's not really chewed. You just kind of put it on the side of your mouth and suck on it for three hours. <clears throat> uh, for bronchial problems, it's sprinkled, it's dried and broken up into pieces and sprinkled on coals to make smoke, which you then inhale. In the late 1890s, a traveler into Northern Manitoba observed the dried plant among the Cree. And this is what he had to say. He said, large bundles of this plant can be seen hanging in every teepee or wigwam, tent or house, wherever Indians are found, and seems to be the family medicine of the people, its virtues being known to all. A piece of root is carried by every tripper on his hunts and trips for the Hudson Bay Company. And when feeling exhausted by hunger or fatigue, the small piece slowly chewed will restore the flagging energies in a most wonderful manner. Even to this day, we continue to harvest wheat case. And when you attend ceremonies or powwows, you'll see that the singers place small piece of root um, in their mouth as the juices keep their throats clear while they're singing. The Hudson Bay surgeons back in the day used indigenous healers unofficially and adopted some of the local practices. Because fraternizing with natives was prohibited, there was very little evidence 
of the variety and kinds of treatments they learned from Indigenous peoples that were recorded. However, it's clear from what little historical records we have and oral history that Indigenous peoples from my home shared what medicine knowledge they had with the Hudson Bay Company men and increased their gathering of medicinals for trade. The Hudson Bay men also did not view plants and other medicinals the same way we do as relatives. They did not value, appreciate, or understand that in the Cree world, all living things were interconnected and that healing was a holistic endeavor that took into account mind, body, emotions, and spirit. They ridiculed and they rejected the ceremonial components of healing. For example, the use of the sweat lodges and the prayers of the medicine people. And they rudely referred to the medicine people as conjurers. However, when their own healers were unable to cure them, when they ran out of their own medicines, they went to the Cree healers. And if it wasn't too, he too late, they were healed. The servant class especially looked to indigenous healers for help, which was another way the bonds between Orkney men and Cree people were increased. Thank you. Thank you, Winona. Um, the, the knowledge of the Indigenous people was truly priceless and they were, it sounds like they were very generous in sharing that um, knowledge. We have a few questions for you. Um, Maria Pia um, from the last talk asks if the snake food was also the origin of snake oil. I have no idea. I don't know about snake oil. Where does that come from? Who who practices that one? I'm not sure. Maybe um, Maria, you can come back to us and let us know about that. Um, we've got a question from Robert Griffiths. There seems to be parallels between harvesting this root and cattails. Is there any food value in your root? Is it a source of carbohydrate? Not these roots, they're so small and you only ate them in, in little wee quantities. If you ate too much of them, you'd get sick. So you had to be very, very careful with how much you ingested. Cattails on the other hand are a food source. And so you could harvest um, almost the entire plant for different food items, right? Okay, thank you. And um, this is another one from, I think it's from Rich. And um, would it be correct to say that the cures were preventative and best administered as part of a healthy diet and not like contemporary medicine that provides symptomatic relief. Yeah, well, wee case, for example, I mean, I grew up with wee case in my back pocket. You know, my granny would bite off a hunk and stick it in my pocket when we'd leave in the morning just to make sure we had it in case we needed it. So as a little kid, I always had a hunk in my mouth and we never got cold. You know, we were wild, crazy little kids outside all day. So yeah, there was a lot of preventative medication, um, medicate or preventative value in the traditional medicines. Yeah, that's great. Um, and um, I would, what I was wondering was, um, is it tradition that you pass it on, you know, to, to all your family members, um, you know, about some of these um, properties of the plants and things, or is it just as you say, healers that had specialist knowledge? Well, there's the common everyday variety of medicinals like aspirin and Tylenol <clears throat> that, that we all use. Like my family always has weak ace around. We always have Labrador tea around. Um, those are basics and I've got some in my cupboard right now. But then there's the highly specialized medical knowledge and healing knowledge. And those are for really serious ailments. Um, and those are left to the specialists. So for example, if, if I got really, really, and I have, you know, get really, really ill and I don't have the knowledge to, to do, to look after myself, I would go and take my tobacco and a gift and I would ask a, a healer to look after me. And then that's the ceremonial process. So um, part of the major healing would consist of ceremony, um, would consist of singing, it would consist of prayer, it would consist of fasting making personal sacrifices because you're asking the creator for life. So you have to make personal sacrifices for that healing. So it's a really holistic approach to healing 
and it's in the realm of the specialists. They're the ones that have been training for it all their lives, apprenticing for it. They're the ones that have the knowledge. So I definitely go running to them and defer to them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we have weekdays um, on the on the counter right now, as a matter of fact, yeah. um, that we use on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you're saying it's it's kind of it's ceremonial, is it just you and the healer, or is it like a would it be a family thing? It depends on the nature of it. It's usually family. Um, when we get ill and, and we're going in search of, of healing, for example, for cancer treatments, like really serious ailments, the whole family, even the extended family, is involved, and everybody participates. Mm -hmm. um, because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not an island to yourself in this world, right? You're, you've got yeah. relationships and you get strength from those relationships and there's a lot of love. And like I say, it's a holistic approach. It looks after your spirit, your mind, your emotions, your body. Um, and so that's how the healing um, happens. And this, this um, is your kinship tie still as strong as, you know, what, what used to be, like you said that, you, you know, you like to know um, if you're related and your allies or your family and that kind of thing oh yeah when you're in trouble family gets you got your back you know family family is always really strong you know we've gone through a lot of changes over here like we've had a lot of trauma historical trauma and we're still facing a lot of trauma so there has been considerable breakdown in in family and community units but we still have that connection you know so um if i got sick i would call um my cousins all my aunties are gone now but I would call my cousins and they would come and they would rally um, and they would stay by me and they would contribute to the feast and they would contribute to the giveaways and and they would be a part of the healing process very much so yeah, yeah that's lovely to hear um, that you're you're being supported in that way as well mm -hmm. it's really painful when old people are taken out of the home and put into the hospital especially during COVID right now, when you can't have family in there, they just yeah. wither away and die. Um, and so a lot of, yeah, a lot of old people just flat out refuse to go to the hospital because they, they're scared to be away from their loved ones. And um, they want to be close to their healers and, and they want to be in their community. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, I've got Claire Griffiths. Um, she's asking, is there any evidence that these cures um, came back to Scotland? I'm not sure. I know that they were exported out. They were all exported out. And so when the Hudson Bay Company takes it back to London, from there it gets dispersed. So it's pretty likely. But I think it'd be a really awesome research project to find out. Yes. And I, and I guess probably a lot of the workers, you know, the, um, that were over there and maybe went back and forth to, like, say, Orkney, for instance, they, they would have learned some of these um, mm -hmm. from the local Indigenous people. Yeah. And when they got home, I'm sure they paid more attention to their local medicines, too. And uh, how he's asked, um, he said, it's fascinating to hear about the, the contact with the Orkney men, um, as remembered, and it, it would be very interesting to hear more about this. But our connection with the Orkney men? Yes. <clears throat> well, well, as you know from the previous presenter, I'm sure I haven't seen that presentation yet, though, but is that um, the Hudson Bay Company stopped usually in Stromness and picked up a bunch of Orkney men and took them across the Atlantic and into my territory, mostly because they were very hardy. They were tough as nails, right? And um, they <clears throat> and they could work hard and they were excellent in the boats um, because they had to do a lot of um, rowing and paddling and, and a lot of heavy labor. But, you know, the servant class in the Hudson Bay Company was not treated very well. They had pathetic wages and um, not very good living conditions. And they were prohibited from, um, they were actually, the Hudson Bay Company prohibited any kind of conjugal relations with local women, but they couldn't really uphold that. Even the officers themselves couldn't uphold that because um, sometimes in the treaty making ceremony, I mean, a marriage cemented that relationship, right? and also adoption. And so sometimes, you know, a young man from Orkney or England would be given to the Cree people and a local Cree boy would be given to the Hudson Bay Company and they would raise them. And they, that way they learned the languages and they learned the ways and they could be translators and they could be guides. It'd be very useful that way. But it was also about making family. 
And that's what the treaty making alliance system was all about, was making relations. And so there ended up being a lot of, of intermarriage, a lot. Um, and um, my daughter, for example, her ancestors to her father's side consist of Stevensons and Murdochs and Kirknesses, you know, as, and so, and then I've got all of the Andersons and the Sinclairs and the McNabs on my side. So there was a lot of intermarriage that went on. And in, in many instances, the, the Orkney men just kind of assimilated in, they didn't go home, they stayed. You know, they, they worked till the end of their contracts, they renewed those contracts, they stayed. And when they retired, they retired here. And even a few of the officers also with indigenous wives did that. So there was a really strong relationship. And, um, and we have so much evidence still of that Orkney connection, even though none of us speak Gaelic um, and we haven't had any kind of direct relationships with people from Scotland for four or five generations. I mean, we have Bannock. I mean, Bannock has now become a traditional <laughs> Cree food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. And we have and we have the fiddle and the fiddle is so valued in our communities. And um, even in my own family, we've got, we've got fiddle players and jiggers, you know, and we've got the oral history, you know, the stories of the great, great grandfather with the red beard that used to scare all the little kids. <laughs> so, you know, we have this oral tradition and we have, um, you know, we, we have a lot of the, the, the bannock and the fiddles, um, and so that we've always been aware of that connection, right? even though we've lost contact with the actual family itself. Yes. And what's really awesome is that so many of my people are doing genealogy work and they're tracing back. And we've got this amazing wealth of, of information in the Hudson Bay Company archives for genealogical research. And we're tracing back to our um, original ancestors who came over from over there. And, and um, my cousin Miriam, um, did a lot of research on the McNabb family line and she found Dr. John McNabb. Um, and then she hopped on a plane and went over and, and visited some of the family. So that's really awesome, you know, making that connection. Um, and then we found one of the descendants of Dr. John's sister. Um, <clears throat> we found him over there and he had been doing genealogy and he'd been wondering whatever happened, you know. Um, whatever happened to the descendants of, of Dr. John McNabb? And I said, here we are, you know, George Gordon's Indian Reserve. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, obviously, the records must be quite good if you're able to trace the, the, the family back. Well, that's one thing the Hudson Bay Company did really well was keep excellent records. So there's an entire archives full of their material. Yeah. But, um, Maria um, Pia is asking, um, are there publications and articles about this and um, is it an important aspect in the study of the exchanges between um, Hudson Bay Company people and First Nations? There's a few stories. There's a few medical anthropologists, um, medical historians who have studied um, Indigenous medicinals um, and then um, there was also, there's also historians who have studied the Hudson Bay Company. Um, there's, there hasn't been anything that, that brings all of that together, you know, that places Indigenous knowledge into the picture. They just treat it as just a hunk of root, you know. <laughs> they don't put it in its cultural context. Um, and so that's missing um, in the literature, mm -hmm. is understanding these, these medicinals from, you know, two different perspectives, what we call two-eyed seeing. That hasn't been done yet. Is that something that that that, um, that 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 you would share? You know, with people like the whole the holistic thing. Is it something that you would share? I would love to. I mean, I'm just starting my research on this. I'm finding it absolutely fascinating, and and I would love to carry on with this research um, and and um, learn more because there's way more um, medicines that we had that I'm sure we shared with them. Um, but I haven't heard a lot in the oral history from my people. So it would mean um, digging through the, the archives with a fine tooth comb and maybe making a visit over there to find out what they've got, what they brought over. But yeah, it's a story that I think is really valuable and, and it needs to be researched and told more in more depth. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and how he's asking, um, with all the problems of Western society associated with individualism, 
Could it be a time when traditional values of community could help to heal? That's what we're trying, Howie. You know, I always, I, I'm, I've been teaching Indigenous studies for 35 years. And when I teach about colonialism, um, um, one of the first things I stress to students is that colonialism introduced three big uglies. I call them the big uglies, individualism, materialism, and the patriarchy. And those had a really negative impact on our community structures and our family systems. Um, but we're recognizing that now. So we're in the process of decolonizing, which means intellectual decolonization as well, understanding how it is we've gotten to the situation we're in today. And um, starting to listen to the old people again, who stress that community is more important than the person. You know, that we live for the community. We contribute to the community. It's not a me, me, me value system. It's a collective value system. And that's coming back again, slowly. Um, it's coming back. In some areas, you see it's still strong. But it's piecing it back together in a capitalist society that's all about rapid individualism. And it's really, really difficult. But it's being done. And it's being taught. And it's being practiced as best we can. Yeah. So that's good to hear. I think we could do with more of that, definitely. Um, I don't know if you um, were aware of um, another one of our talks um, was by um, Maya Shikabi, um, where she's been doing work on preserving um, language um, mm. through, for the young people through the use of um, like gaming um, on different levels and you learn different languages. I don't know if that's something that you've come across. Mm -hmm. Well, language revitalization is a big thing over here as well. And I'm really fascinated by um, the language revitalization activities that are going on over your way with the revival of the Gaelic language. But here, I mean, we got some languages that are already gone. They're dead. There's no speakers left. Amongst my people, uh, we've got the largest number of um, Indigenous language speakers among the Cree in, in what is now Canada. And so it's, um, we haven't lost it yet. However, it's lost so quickly. It's lost in a generation. One yeah. generation, you can lose it. You know, like my grandmother and grandparents spoke fluent Cree, but they were scared um, that their children would be punished for speaking Cree. They were scared their children would be punished for having a Cree accent um, because their kids had to go to residential school. And so they made a decision to protect their children to, to not teach them Cree. So my mom and my aunties and uncles grew up understanding Cree, but not speaking it. And so they couldn't pass it on to us. And in later years, you know, when I was a teenager, my grandmother was so sad. She said, I was, I'm, I'm so, so angry with myself for making that decision. She said, but I was so scared for my little girls. So part of our healing process, part of our decolonization process is, is taking things back that were taken from us. And so language revitalization is, is really a powerful movement. We teach it in the university. We have um, language camps, culture camps out on the land, a lot of land-based Cree immersion programs going on. It's introduced to the um, K-12 education system. We've got um, kindergarten that's Cree, um, Cree immersion kindergarten and up to grade six. So they're making a lot of effort to, to try to revive it. And what's fascinating, of course, is that the little kids pick it up really, really quick. So the little kids and the old people, you know, worked together. The old people transmitted to the little people. And those of us in the middle kind of got left out, right? We just kind of <laughs> tag along and, and pick it up where we can, right? <clears throat> but it's, it's awesome to see it coming back. We even have a um, University of Victoria has um, a master's and a PhD program in Indigenous language revitalization. So it's a pretty top priority. It's also one of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to put a, to urge Canadian institutions and communities and governments to put a lot of resources and effort into language reclamation. So a lot of institutions, universities and communities are, are taking up that call. That's great, and it's good to start them when they're young as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Um, a few more questions. And um, we've got um, one from Rich. He says, "What sort of society structure did you have other than patriarchy?" 
Oh, I teach a whole class in that. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, we did not have matriarchy. We did not have patriarchy. I guess the, the best anthropological term um, to use would be we were egalitarian. So that there was no one gender or age group that was more important than the other. Um, our value system was very different. For example, nobody could own anybody else. Everybody, every person was an autonomous being that had their own power and their own rights. So in our traditional systems, um, women were autonomous. And that's pretty evident in, in the naming, you know, how in, in Western Europe, you've got the surname system and that's all about property rights, right? That's all about the property of owning women, property of owning children and chattels. Um, but in our societies, we never had surnames. Everybody had individual names. Um, and you were an autonomous being. So women had um, the right to marry who they wanted. Women had the right to own property. Actually, in our, um, in our communities, women owned the household. So they owned the lodge, the TP lodge, um, and they were the boss of that lodge. Um, women had the right um, over the reproductive systems. Women had the right to divorce. And um, my mom, um, and aunties used to laugh about pre-divorce. You know, it's just stuffing all this stuff in a garbage bag and putting it outside the door. Poof, divorce. <laughs> because women had that right and they practiced that right. So there was no male dominance, right? Which is the core of the patriarchy. Men could not own women, could not own children. In fact, in many of our societies, they were what's called matrilineal, where the children belong to the community of the mother, not the father and the father marries into that community. So it's a very different value system, right? Very different. And so when the first Hudson Bay Company people, the first Europeans arrived here, what they were struck with was something totally opposite of what they were accustomed to and what they knew. And uh, they could not handle females or, or women who had personal autonomy. Um, I mean, our women were the trappers of small animals, the hunters of small animals. Their primary role was protection and, and providing um, for, the, for the old people and the babies. Um, and the European men couldn't handle that. And so they introduced the patriarchy and through the marriage, they imposed the patriarchy. And it was a really rough time for a lot of indigenous women. It was hard times. You know, having control over your reproductive system is really, really important when you're a migratory people. Um, and you can only carry one kid on your hip at a time. Right? So women spaced their babies four or five years apart. But with intermarriage, you know, um, birth control was prohibited. And so these women suddenly were having nine, 10, 11, 12 babies and they were burning out um, and it really affected their health. So yeah, um, male dominance is a corollary of colonialism. It was introduced, it was imposed. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you, you could come back and do a talk on, on that whole structure at, mm -hmm. uh, sometime. That would be good. Um, I've got a few questions uh, just before we wrap up. And um, I want to go back to the beavers. Um, Rich has asked, how long did it take or have they ever recovered the beaver population? It's recovered. It's recovered. Those beavers are really smart. <laughs> they, they really are. Um, and... <clears throat> yeah, they've recovered very well. In fact, there's still um, a fur trade happening here. It's not, of course, as, as huge as it once was, but there's still um, trappers in the north. And I've got friends whose families still have trap lines and they still go out winter trapping. Um, and, and the beaver have recovered, you know. So there's, in fact, there's a, <clears throat> I live between two rivers. I live between the North Saskatchewan and the South Saskatchewan River rivers and um, there's beaver dams in tributaries and creeks around my home which is really awesome to see they're very destructive though you know they chop down all the trees and stuff but yeah they're back <laughs> that's good to hear it's good to hear mm -hmm. and just finally a comment from Howie um you know are there possibilities for collaboration between researchers in Orkney and Canada and would it be it would be so interesting to trace the connections between Orkney and yourselves Absolutely. I mean, I think that'd be absolutely awesome. So how would we have to talk about this? 
<laughs> they have, <laughs> we have to get the network set up because I think there's wonderful opportunities for student exchanges, for research collaborations, you know, um, teasing out, discovering the, the depth and breadth of those relationships and, and the influences that we had on each other and the family ties. Yes. You know, we've got okay. stories. We've got stories of um, children of fur traders who were taken back to Scotland and taken back to England. No idea where they are. Yeah. Yes, I think um, in the last talk, I think um, one of our viewers, um, Pat, um, she knew of someone that was in Hudson Bay Company that took his, his sons back to Scotland um, to get educated. Mm -hmm. I think the daughters were left here, uh, sorry, with, with you in Canada. Um, so mm -hmm. there, there's bound to be lots of stories on, on both sides of, of the Atlantic. Well, thank you mm -hmm. very much, mm -hmm. uh, Winona. Um, uh, and thank you, everybody that's put questions in and everybody that's viewed, and I'm sure this will be viewed again um, as a recording. Um, we're so lucky to have you with us. Um, and the next talk um, tonight is at 8 p.m., a story of a man who developed a radical theory of evolution. But before that, at seven o'clock, we've got Kirkwell City Pipe Band. Um, if you go into the website, you'll be able to see their recording from last year. And if you're all enjoying the, con the, the festival, please consider uh, donating. Full details of how to do so are below. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube, uh, like us and subscribe. And don't forget about our festival club. Um, this will be open at half past nine. So we hope to see you later tonight. Um, have a dram and maybe a bannock uh, with you. Um, and that's all for, for now. And thank you to the tech team. Um, goodbye. And thank you again, Winona. Thank you all. Thank you.